Good evening, everybody. This is OL Nation, session six. Six months have gone, and we've been having fun sharing our life stories and professional lives with us. Thank you, everybody in India and all across the world for joining us. We have a great session lined up as usual. And now, coming all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, is our one and only co-host, Kalpana Kutaya. Kalpana has been with us right from the very beginning, and she's going to take it away. Take it away, Kalpana. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Rohan. Thank you very much once again for joining another session of uh, OL Nation. We are happy to bring you this health and wellness segment. Uh, if you remember when we got back from our holidays in school, we would all um, be di directed di to the hospital and we had to produce our immunization report, our, take our heights and weights. All of that was to ensure that we stayed well, we were happy and we kept well. So before starting, let me do, give you a couple of housekeeping tasks. The first is if you have joined a webinar live, please type in your questions in the Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen. And if you have joined on YouTube or Facebook, we have volunteers who will pick up your questions and send it to us. Please make sure to let us know which panelist or speaker you are addressing your question to and we'll make sure they get answered. The second would be to please um, have a paper and pen handy because you will need that in the first part of our session. Health and wellness has never been so important in each and every one of the world, to everyone in the world this year. This year has been unusual for all of us. Our physical health, our mental health has been um, tested and tried with all the seclusion and that we've dealt with in this pandemic. Our opening panelist is going to address uh, the health and wellness issues. He's Adrian Kennedy, Arvilly House, batch of 1965, who has a unique never given story. His extremely impressive bio and a career has been posted on social media. Over many decades, he has won multiple academic and sports awards. A few highlights of his career are as follows. He's won the President's, President of India gold medal for the best student, best school student, Governor of West Bengal medical best student, university student, a PhD in holistic practitioner, Harvard Medical School Faculty Lifestyle Medicine, National and Asian Champion for 100 and 200 meters, multiple sports and national and international participation, including leading a team that swam the English Channel. He has been a leader and a trailblazer in the world of wellness, where he started pioneering work at Harvard University. Today, he's known globally as a distinguished health researcher, a corporate wellness leader, and an ambassador of lifestyle medicine. In 2017, he won a top 100 global healthcare leader. His topic for today is entitled Health and Lifestyle Assessment. Adrian, please unmute your mic and take it away. Hey, Kalpana, how are you? Good, thank you, Adrian. Good. Glad to be good, here good, with you. Good. Now, uh, for the rest of my friends, for the rest of my friends, uh, uh, Kalpana is coming from Atlanta, and I am speaking to you from Dubai. Glad to meet okay, you. Friends. Yeah. Okay, good day, good day. I asked Kalpana the question, how are you? And uh, this entire session is going to be an answer to that question as to how you are. A series of health and lifestyle tests, we will talk about that in a minute. Now, I will attempt to tell you exactly how you are, keeping in mind a series of health and lifestyle tests. Now, I'm quite sure you would have uh, done a medical test. My tests are all lifestyle related. And why are they lifestyle related? Because the biggest killer worldwide today is lifestyle. Okay, friends. In order to start this test, we just need to keep in mind the basic definition of health. Health as defined by the WHO in 1956 is not just the absence of illness, but a state of physical, mental, social, and spiritual well-being. 
Now, if you were to go for a medical check, it would tell you how ill you are. But if you were to go for a medical check, uh, a health check like the one I'm proposing, well, then we will evaluate your nutrition, your diet, uh, your physical fitness, your stress levels, your entire complex of health and give you what is known as a health score. And the good news is we will correlate that health score with your age. You could be younger than you are or you could be older than you are. Take your date of birth as your legal age. Your body's age is different depending upon the way you have treated it. Now, in order to do this series of tests, all you need is to record the tests that you have passed or failed, but basically the tests that you have passed. Uh, in my days, we used a pencil and paper. Many of my younger colleagues, including my uh, son and daughter, nowadays use their mobiles to record everything. So health is not merely the absence of illness, but you cannot evaluate health without evaluating illness first. So I'm going to ask you just three quick medical questions. Each question will not take more than a minute, not more than a minute. So my first question is, do you have a family history? And a family history is defined as your biologic family, your biologic family meaning your parents or grandparents or siblings. Do anyone in your family, parents, grandparents or siblings, have they had a heart attack or cancer? Or do they have hypertension or diabetes? Now, if that is the case, the assumption is that you have a family history of these ailments and you are at risk. It would, then mean, it would then mean that you will have failed test number one. So in the column or in the area where you record whether you've passed or failed, you may just kindly write fail. It means that you have a risk for getting these ailments in future years unless you do not change your lifestyle. So that is test number one. Test number two. Most of the modern day ailments, most of the modern day ailments are silent. Hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesteremia. Most of them are silent. You have no indication that you have this ailment unless you have a medical check. And then your blood will be checked. You will have an X-ray of the bony structure. You will have an ECG and all these different tests which will tell you exactly what illness you have. And therefore my question number two is, have you had a medical check during the last one year? Have you had a medical check during the last one year? If you have had a medical check, you will have passed this test. If you have not had a medical check, you will fail test number two. Now remember, what we are trying to do is to help you to evaluate your health, keeping in mind your lifestyle. Test number three, or question number three. Are you currently taking any medication? We usually take medication if there's a breakdown in somebody's system. If you have a headache, you will take a pill for a headache. If you have arthritis, you will take a pill to reduce that pain. If you have hypertension or diabetes or hypercholesteremia, you will take medication. So my question to you here is, are you currently on any form of medication? If you are on some medication, you will fail test number three. So I've asked you three simple questions on the medical aspect. You will have completed three tests and indicated whether you have passed or failed. Now, health is not merely the absence of illness. It is a state of physical, mental, social and psychological well-being. So we now talk about the physical aspects. The first test, way back in 1990, when the world, uh, when, when the Metropolitan Life Insurance started evaluating health, the first thing that they defined was that if you are overweight, you will be unhealthy in future years. So the first test that I have to ask of you is, do you 
remain or are you within the height weight range as indicated by this chart? Now, this is a standard height weight chart. Height weight BMI, it's all the same thing, more or less. If you are within this height weight chart ratio, your height is given. If you're a male, the weight range is available. If you're a female, the weight range is available. Check to see whether you are in this height weight range. And if you are, you will have passed the test. Now, these tests will, uh, uh, will be shown later uh, for the next month in uh, the OL, uh, in the OL uh, 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 channels such as Facebook and uh, other such things. So you could follow it through at that time also. In 1960, I'm now going to test number five. In 1960, we discovered that all world champions in the Rome Olympics, 90% of world champions in the Rome Olympics were overweight. And the reason why they were overweight was they had high ranges of body fat. They had high ranges, I take that back, they had high ranges of body muscle but low ranges of body fat. We discovered at that time that it was not excess muscular weight that caused the problem, but excess body fat. And excess body fat, especially around the mid region, especially around the abdomen, is a major risk factor. Now, there are many ways in which you can measure this body fat around the mid region. One of the ways is Test number five, as indicated over here, or another simple way is you simply measure your you simply measure your waist and then measure the upper pectoral across your chest, or in case you're a lady, measure the upper hip, and in case your waist is larger than your chest or your upper hip, you will have failed the test. But in this instance, we have asked you to take a pinch test, which is pinch that roll of fat that is above your hip, and then measure that against the first phalange of your finger. Not the full finger, but the first phalange. In case it measures within the first phalange of your finger, it would mean that you have the, uh, the allowable body fat ranges for a human. The allowable ranges for your information for the female is 23%. And for the male is 18%. But for us, it is just one inch of fat around the abdominal region. Now that was test number five. Test number six, cardiorespiratory. Perhaps the most important test here in the sense that more than 60% of individuals around the world will succumb to a cardiac ailment. And therefore, this is cardiorespiratory heart and lung. In terms of fitness, this is known as stamina. This is test number six. In this instance, I will not ask you to take your pulse rate, which is the cardio test. Uh, it may be difficult for many of us to take our pulse rate. We are not used to it. But I will ask you to hold your breath. I am now testing your lung capacity which means I will ask you to take a deep breath. Just watch me, take a deep breath. And then hold your breath for as long as you can. I am now talking in terms of test number six. So I'm going to ask you to take a deep breath and then I'm going to ask you to hold your breath for as long as you can. I will uh, keep a watch on the time of 45 seconds, but you may utilize your own stopwatches also. Ready? Please breathe. Now hold your breath for as long as you can. If you have hypertension or are asthmatic, you could discontinue the test if you feel any difficulty. 15 seconds over. For the rest of us who are robust and who have an abundant lung capacity and who believe they have enough stamina, forge on. You have now completed 30 seconds. I would like you to hold your breath if possible in order to pass this test for another 15 seconds, of which you have five seconds to go. Four, three, two, 
One. Okay. You can take a deep breath. You have passed that test. You have passed test number six, hopefully. And now we have test number seven, musculoskeletal. Muscle means, well, muscular means the muscle and skeletal means the bone and joints. Usually for the muscular test, I might ask you to do a sit-up, but I'm not going to ask you to do a sit-up today. I will perhaps ask you to do what might seem an easier test for you, but is usually a more difficult test for most. And that is, can you touch your toes? Test number seven, spinal flexibility. Get off the chair and see if you can touch your toes, keeping your knees locked. If you can touch your toes, it means that you have a supple back, you have good joint mobility, you will not be susceptible to back ailments, arthritis and spondylosis. So please go ahead and try that test. And once you complete it, give yourself a pass or a fail mark. Now, your height, weight and body fat ratios evaluated your structure. Cardiorespiratory was stamina, musculoskeletal was strength and flexibility. All these put together is physical activity. And the rule on physical activity is very simple. Do you exercise in terms of walking, jogging, cycling, swimming, uh, going to the gym, or doing any activity not included in your day-to-day -day activities? You could, of course, benefit from climbing steps and things like that, but no, this is the half hour that you dedicate to exercise. Do you exercise every day for at least half an hour or 45 minutes? Personally, I would like one hour a day. But if I were to go by world standards, as enunciated by the American College of Sports Medicine, it is 30 minutes a day or one hour every alternate day. If you do not exercise for this period, you would fail test number eight. Now, we've evaluated uh, your physical fitness. Now, let's talk about your diet. The food you eat, you are what you eat. And the early remedies by the father of medicine, Hippocrates, was in fact diet. And he said, your food is your medicine or your poison. So the test over here is very simple. The best food that you can possibly eat is fruit and vegetables. They contain minerals and vitamins and antioxidants and carbohydrate traces of protein, fiber, almost everything that you need. So do you eat fruit and vegetable every day? I, for myself, have a fruit at breakfast and a salad at lunch. Remember, when I say vegetable, I mean it needs to be uncooked in the form of a salad. So test number nine, do you eat uncooked fruit and vegetables every day? If you do, you pass test number nine. Now the human body uh, is fluid. Our blood, 99% fluid. The brain, 80% fluid. Your bones, 66% fluid. Your muscles, 88% fluid. So the body requires fluid. Now how do you know that you are having sufficient fluid? Well, the technical ratio is for every 10 kgs of body weight, 200 ml of fluid. But for me, the question, or for me, the suggestion in this test is very simple. Do you have at least six glasses of water? Six glasses of water. One bottle of water or one glass of water is about 200 ml. So do you have about six glasses of water every day? That would be about a liter and a half. Now remember I said water, and water is not compensatable by beer. Just keep that in mind, friends. So I'm talking in terms of test number 10. In order to pass that, you have to have had six glasses of water every day. Now, if fruit and vegetable is your best food, then your worst food is perhaps the tastiest.
We are talking in terms of hamburgers and Kentucky chicken and noodles and pasta and macaroni and so on and so forth, commercial foods that you buy from the local market. Now they have extra sugar, extra salt, extra chemicals, extra coloring, extra preservatives, all to make them better than natural foods in terms of their taste, perhaps. But remember, the second largest cause of cancer in the world is commercial foods. So therefore, you must avoid eating commercial foods and you will fail this test in case you eat outside your home or you eat commercial foods more than twice a week. Twice a week. In case you exceed that, your food toxicity builds up. And in 20 or 30 years, you could be victim to the second biggest killer in the world, and that is cancer. At the end of this session, you will have completed, at the end of this, this slide, you will have completed 11 tests. So please check to see whether you have completed 11 tests. Now we move on. Up to now, I uh, questioned or I uh, evaluated you on the medical aspect, on the physical aspect and the nutritional aspect. I am now evaluating you on the psychological aspect or the psychosocial aspect. So the first question, psychosoma. Psychosoma uh, is defined as ailments caused by mental stress. And some of the indicators that you could be under mental stress are headaches. So my question is, do you have any of the following? Do you frequently, defined as once a week, do you frequently have headaches? Are you frequently irritable and short-tempered? Do you have problems with sleep? Now, those three aspects evaluate the mind or the neurological system in a light way. Do you have trouble breathing? Do you have cough and cold? Do you have asthma and bronchitis? That evaluates the respiratory system. Do you have digestive ailments, constipation, perhaps a loose tummy? That would be your digestive system. Do you have pains in the muscles and joints? That would be the muscular and the bony system. Do you have hypertension or diabetes? Or that would be your circulatory system. Do you have allergies? We have a complete session on allergy within the next few minutes. Do you have allergies? These allergies could be caused by mental stress and tension or at any rate, aggravated by stress and tension. Now, if you have any, any one or many of these, you will fail test number 12. It means that you have a psychosomatic tendency. That's test number 12. Test number 13 is your personality. Now, if you were to go for a job, the HR manager will very likely evaluate many aspects about your qualifications and so on and so forth. And he or she will also look at your personality. Are you ambitious? Are you competitive? Are you result-oriented? Are you hardworking? In case you are any of these, you will most likely get the job. You are an executive type personality. We are looking at test number 13. You are an executive type personality. You will most likely get the job, but from a medical perspective, keep in mind, that you are a high stress type A cardiac prone personality. And this personality will take its toll on your health. We would prefer that you have a more gentle personality in terms, it's called a type B personality, 
where you uh, where, where where you are less driven, where you compete with yourself rather than compete with others. But test number thirteen is your personality test. Ambitious, competitive, result-oriented, executive type personalities. It'll have an impediment on your health, and therefore you fail test thirteen. Otherwise, you pass. We are talking stress. Where do you have the most stress? The most stress you will have at work or in your occupation, even or more so, if you are a homemaker, you will have stress, getting the kids dressed, getting the kids to school, tidying the house, cleaning the dishes, and so on. And if you are a worker, getting to work, working under a boss who very likely you don't like, working for a salary which very likely is too little, working at a location which very likely is too far off, doing a job which is not to your satisfaction. So you will have stress. And most of the people say, well, that is what you are paid for. But you will pass this test if, like me, you love your job. I'm paid too little, my boss is a pain, my work is too far, but I love my job. And my job is my hobby rather than my work. And therefore I pass the test. And in case you have a similar feeling of passion for your work and you love your job in spite of all its limitations, you too will pass test number 14. Otherwise, regretfully you fail. For all of us gentlemen, we need to know that our home is our castle and you are the king of your castle. But we know that all castles are ruled by the queen. And therefore, you could have stresses at home. As a matter of fact, 49% of homes have stressful situations. And these stressful situations can come not only from your spouse, but can also come from the children who may be unwell or not doing too well academically. Or it could come from your in-laws or the ill health of your parents. It could come from any of these sources. And if you are stressed at home, you would fail. Test number 15. Test number 16 relates to stress and daily routine or stress and problems, stress and crisis. If you have a problem, usually it is stressful. How do you eradicate that problem? By solving the problem. But there are certain problems that cannot be solved immediately. During the pendency of a problem, you will have stress. Now, what is stress? Stress is the extra secretion of adrenaline within the system that causes the body to hyperventilate. It causes the body to have increased heart rate, increased circulation. All of these are good in terms of a physical reaction. It gives you strength and it gives you agility. But these days, physical reactions are not a solution to stress. Or if you have a problem that has no solution for six months, financial, legal, any of these problems that has no solution for six months, you will have stress during that period and you fail test number 16. Test number 16, if you have a problem without a solution, you fail test number 16. We all need support systems. As human beings, one of the most difficult thing during this lockdown period is the fact that we are unable to meet our friends and our family. We all need support systems. You need someone whose shoulder you can lean on. You need someone who you can turn to with your problems. You need someone who can help you to solve your problems. If it's a legal problem, you need your lawyer, a financial problem. You need your banker, an emotional problem. You need your family. But if you are without support systems, if you do not have somebody that you can turn to when you have a problem, if you do not have somebody that you can turn to, then 
you will fail test number 17 by virtue of the fact that you have no support systems. I now move to stress to test number 18. We all believe that sleep is an unimportant part of our lives. But understand this, when you sleep, your entire body system moves down. You move down from, uh, your pulse rate drops from about 70 pulse rates to about 50 pulse rate. Your respiration drops. Your brain waves drop. While you are awake, you have beta brain waves at 48 cycles per second. While you sleep, you have, you have delta and theta brain waves, which are four cycles per second. And when this happens, the body releases growth hormone. It releases hormones that help to heal the body, healing hormones. And sleep is so important for good health. It is nature's method to cure all your ills during the night while you sleep. You need eight hours of sleep. If you cannot get eight hours of sleep, or if you do not have eight hours of sleep, and you certainly have less than seven or six hours of sleep, you fail this test. It doesn't matter whether you sleep for two hours in the afternoon or six hours in the day, that makes up to eight hours. That's good enough for me. A siesta is not a bad thing. So eight hours of sleep in a day means that you will have passed this test. Now, what was once considered the biggest health, health impediment in the world, smoking, is today still a major factor in the causation of disease. If you smoke, certainly your risk of cancer rides at 60%. We are talking about test number 19. Your, test, your risk of cancer rides at about 60%, but not only that. By your smoking, the environmental factors will put your child at risk and your child could become an addict to smoking in later years. You do not want to smoke at home under any circumstances. There is a lot of conflicting research about alcohol. Of course, in the Middle East, uh, I'm sorry, in the Mediterranean, we say that wine is excellent. And of course it is. It contains flavonoids, uh, and other such things that are good for the heart and good for the blood, but all within limitations. And the limitation is do not drink every day. Do not exceed two drinks a day on any occasion. If you can maintain those stringent rules, you will pass this test, otherwise you fail. So I'm going to encapsulate test number 19. Test number 19 is simple enough. If you smoke, you fail. If you drink alcohol and exceed the limits of one unit, a glass of wine, a glass of beer, or one drink. If you exceed that too often, if you exceed it at two every day, you fail. I leave this to your discretion. Give yourself a pass or a fail mark on test number 19. We now have test number 20, and that is the final test. The final test number 20, safety, at, safety above all else, safety at all times. I'm talking about automobile safety. The biggest killer of young people in the world today is the automobile. You have to have safety at all times. And I mean safety in all areas of recreational activity. And that includes uh, many hazardous, uh, many hazardous uh, activities. But nevertheless, if you adhere to the real rules of safety, if you are safety conscious all the time, every time, you pass this test. That would mean wearing seat belts. That would mean using non-safety, uh, non-slip rugs at home. That would mean holding on to the railing when you're stepping down uh, the staircase and so on and so forth. Now you will have completed 20 tests. And now is the time for reckoning to find out exactly how well we are. Add up all the tests that you have passed. It'll take you a minute, add up all the tests that you have passed. And remember the little notation at the bottom, these tests are indicative, they do not replace a medical check. These tests are indicative, but they are 90% indicative. They are a true reflection of your lifestyle and your health. Now, if you have scored anything between 17 to 20 points, 
It means that your health is above 85%. Your health score is above 85%. You are exceedingly well. You are very well. Only 15% of the people in the world have these health ratios. Congratulations. Your answer to the question, how are you, is I am very well. Now, if you have scored between 13 to 16 points, it would mean that your health score is above 65% and it goes up to about 84%. The answer to the question, how are you, in your case is, I am well. A little bit here and a little bit there and you can improve your health. But if you have passed only 12 to 10 tests, between 10 and 12 tests, your health score is, your health score is, below, is between 50 and 64. It means that 50% of your body systems are malfunctioning or are dysfunctional. At any rate, your lifestyle is all wrong by 50%. Your answer to the question, how are you, is I am not well. I am not well, thank you. I am not well. Now, in case you have passed less than nine tests, it would then mean that you, you have scored less than 50 in lifestyle, you have scored less than 50 in health evaluation, you are, are at high risk for getting lifestyle-related ailments, hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, obesity, etc. in future years. Now, how does this correlate with your age? We have discovered that your true age depends upon your body condition. So if you have scored above 85% or your points are between 20 and 17, you may minus five years from your age, keeping 25 as the minimum age, which means you can be as young as 20 years. Those of us who are already 25, you can reduce by five years, but those who are 20 and below, well, you remain at the age that you are. But for the rest of us who have scored between 20 and 17 points, you may minus five years from your age, your body condition is better than your chronological age. If you are between 13 to 16 points and uh, scored between 65 to 84, your age and your date of birth are the same, well done. You can do better, but well done. Now we come to the rest of us who have not done so well. If your health score is between 50 to 64, or the points that you have scored are less than 12 and up to 10, you are actually older than you are. You have what is known as the accelerated aging syndrome. You need to improve your health. And finally, in case you have fed very badly, and you're less than 50% functional, scoring less than 10 or 9 in these tests. You have an accelerated aging syndrome, and you are far older than you are. Now, you may imagine that this is a statement made lightly. It is not. There are many individuals who at 60 have not had hypertension or diabetes, and there are many at 40 who have already had a heart attack. The truth is that the 40-year-old is perhaps 60, and the 60-year-old is perhaps 40. Now, that brings me to the end of my test today and my colleague uh, from Atlanta, that would be Kalpana, will be coming in to take over from me. But I want to thank you all very much for having participated in these tests. Uh, and do not be angry with me in case you haven't done well, but you may get in touch with me to help you, to help me, to help you to improve. Thank you so much. And thank you, Kalpana, for coming back. Thank you very much, Adrian. That was a good uh, exercise indeed. And I am glad I answered your question correctly when you asked me, how are you? I am, I am very well because I did do very well on your test. <laughs> and that was the answer I gave you. In fact, I've already taken the liberty of minusing five years from my birth certificate and I'm happy to be back here. So thank you very much for doing that for us. Appreciate it. So to come on next, I'd like to welcome Johnny Paul. He's a Windia House batch of 1970. I think you all know Johnny very well. He is the president of our old Laurentian Association uh, that brings us, brings you uh, and the OL community these events every month um, and, and so much more actually. Welcome Johnny, please unmute your mic and take it away.
John, you would have to unmute your mic. I think you're still muted. We can't hear you, John, if you're speaking. Okay, sorry about that, Kalpana. Yeah, that's fine, thank you. I was trying to do it on top with Kun. It was not. No, it's, you're good, you're good. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, Adrian. I think I, I wouldn't have probably done as well as Kalpana <laughs> on your tests. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. So thank you for all, uh, all of you for being here. And I must say that over the past six months, our number of viewership has been going up very well. I think the last OL Nation crossed uh, 20,000 views. Uh, keep it going. So last Monday, I was up at uh, Lovedale and Uti also. I went up to Uti to register the Old Laurentians Foundation, which will be basically handling those donations that you may give us, and uh, it will go to the school. So the headmaster of Lawrence School will be a permanent trustee on this foundation. So once the papers are ready, I will let you know. This is what we had uh, committed in the last AGM, and it's has gone well. Uh, while at Lovedale, uh, discussing with the headmaster, I was really happy to know that uh, the number of applications or at least the inquiries for coming to Lawrence School Lovedale has gone up considerably. And he feels that uh, our events have contributed to this because the Lawrence School Lovedale was not very well known, especially in the North India. When you said Lawrence School, it was always an hour, but now Lovedale has also taken its place in the sun. Uh, I don't want to waste your time. I will get the headmaster on as soon as uh, this is over. And thank you very much. There you are, Mr. Prabhar is online. Welcome, sir. You need to unmute. Done. Hope you can hear me. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for that nice introduction, um, Johnny. I must tell you. Uh, first of all, before going that, I, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Adrian Kennedy. I'm not very well. I'm okay. I'm well. I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> My level must be very well. A uh, very informative and um, very very thought provoking ideas. Uh, first of all, you know, not many people in today's world. Um, invest on welfare and well-being. Very often, you know, a very competitive a materialistic world in terms of adult, in, in terms of students, marks, grades, achievements, and placements. And in this is mad rush of, you know, catching up with all these, somewhere down the line, we slip out from very well to well to, you know, unwell situation. It's, it's something which someone like me who into education uh, should impart this to my students also. Thank you very much. Uh, to start with. Second is that about um, Oil Nation. It has been a very, very inspiring event. I have got a lot of uh, positive feedback from students. Continue, keep doing it. Even after this, uh, you know, the pandemic over, even after this crisis is over, uh, we look forward to these sessions, which are very informative, uh, as well as thought-provoking. So that is something. Uh, back to the school, um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. The situation in, in Nilgiris, in Tamil Nadu is improving. Especially in Nilgiri, the number has gone down. The COVID care center, which we were supporting the, the local um, administration, is moved out last month itself. Uh, fumigations and uh, sanitations are all done. Now we are waiting for students to come. Now, today, tomorrow, there is going to be an announcement from the state government that uh, they're going to, to take a call. Uh, by December end or by January, the schools are going to be partially opened, if not complete uh, fully. Uh, most some of the schools in North India, like Uttarakhand, Himachal, and uh, UP and all, is is uh, is opening next week. And uh, by and large, uh, the the board is very clear. CBSE board is very clear that they they are going ahead with the board examination for the next academic year. The date sheets not yet come, but there is a lot of uh, positivity here, and we are waiting for that. And as far as uh, uh, schools, other issues are concerned, schools are going on pretty well. Occasional showers and the effect of the cyclones are not that much, but still uh, rains and cold weather is uh, sometimes uh, continues as Loudale is known for that. 
our first round of uh, uh, aptitude analysis, that is for the admission is done. And we've got a lot of um, um, positive uh, signals, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, children have taken part. And uh, considering that we are giving one more window that is uh, sometime next month we'll decide maybe in january we'll be offering one more uh, test that is aptitude test for fifth sixth and uh, 11th uh, seven eight nine and are completely full and uh, the withdrawal from school for the past few years have come down and the registration is going up and uh, something uh, nice about the situation is that in spite of the pandemic and also the crisis situation we felt that you know it might affect our admissions and intake of students but uh, so far we are better off and uh, there is no other specific uh, points at the moment our uh, half yearly examination uh, ca2 is over now we are back we have given a short break from the online classes and after that we are back now classes are going on we are waiting for uh, from uh, for the positive report from the uh, government to reopen as early as possible and of course, it's a pleasure to be a part of your great community, a legacy of 162 years. Keep going and um, looking forward to meet some of you when you're coming this way. Uh, the doors of Lovedale will be always uh, welcome, open for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for that very nice update. And uh, not just for that, but for everything else that you do for our beloved school. We are truly grateful. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank you. So. Um, let me introduce you to two more of our speakers and panelists. The first is, many of you might remember the kind-hearted Mr. Gundra from our school days. And uh, the next speaker is his daughter, Dr. Sujata Ramesh, Champak House, Batch of 1975. She's a pediatric aller allergy and immunology consultant. After being awarded the President's Medal from our school, she graduated from Stanley Medical College and, and completed her residency and fellowship at the State University of New York in Buffalo. She also has served as an associate professor at SUNY Buffalo and is a consultant at Columbia Asia Hospital in Bangalore. Sujata specializes in pediatric allergy disorders such as asthma, food allergies, and many other allergic disorders. She has presented over a hundred invite, she's presented for over a hundred invited lectures and has several publications and peer reviewed interna to international journals. Her research interests include prevention and management of asthma, food allergies, and the impact of urbanization in lifestyle changes. Her other areas of interest is the evaluation of recurrent infection and primary immune deficiency diseases. Sujata is a fellow of both the American Academy and the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Along with being a diplomat of the American Board of Allergy and Immunology and the American Board of Pediatrics. So obviously very well accomplished. She has received many awards, grants, including a Fulbright scholarship and a research grant for the Centers for Disease Control here in Atlanta. Speaking along with Sujata, you will have Shraddha Sidwani, Arvoli House, batch of 1999, who's a clinical psychologist. She's majored in physiology and psychology from the University of Melbourne in Australia, received a master's in psychology with a major of clinical psychology from, from the University of Mumbai, is a trained rational emotive behavioral therapist from Albert Ellis Institute in New York. Shraddha is also a specialized in cognitive behavioral therapist and is certified as one of India's first tobacco trained specialists from the Mayo Clinic here in USA. She has conducted workshops and training courses in schools, colleges, and corporate organizations for students, teachers, counselors, and doctors. She uses all her training and knowledge to treat and address anger-related disorders, phobias, depression, marital discard, parenting, handling children of behavioral, emotional, and social issues, and family counseling. Her areas of ex expertise include all that has been mentioned, and the prime focus is in the field of mental and behavioral health. And coming back with Shraddha and Sujata is Professor Adrian Kennedy, who will be back as a panelist and moderator for the next session. Sujata, Shraddha, and Adrian, welcome, and please unmute your mics and take it away. 
Thank you. I think we've lost Adrian. So, uh, Sujata, you could start your presentation. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kalpana, for that kind introduction. I probably am going to start, uh, go ahead with a presentation. I know uh, Adrian had done a wonderful job pointing out the problem, and I don't know how many of us have failed miserably. I think it's important to see why this is so, understand how this is so, and then take action. So let's see why, how, and then I'm sure Shraddha is going to motivate us to take action and do something about it. So what I'm going to do is to just put this on slideshow for a second. Some, yeah. What I'm going to do is to briefly go over a set of, can you all see this? Are you able to see the slides? It's clear. Okay, great. So we know that allergic disease has increased significantly. I think when we were in school, we hardly heard of allergies. And now I understand there's quite a few children with asthma, allergies, and especially uh, it, it manifests when they run, you know, they get breathless, chronic cough. We see an increase in food allergies and uh, allergic rhinitis. Uh, you see this child sniffing. And if you remember way back in prep school, I'm sure Mrs. Enos always told us that we should use a handkerchief. We forgot the kerchief part and used our hand, sniffing and dribbling. Maybe we had allergic rhinitis. Food allergies has also increased a lot. So let's look at how diet, lifestyle impact this and uh, what we can do to prevent these diseases. When we think of allergic disease, we classically just think of sneezing. Oh, doc, my allergies are just driving me crazy. Oh, oh my God, look at this rash. But the spectrum is much wider. And these are the atopic conditions or allergic conditions. And you see that food allergy and childhood ex eczema has its onset very early. The good news is most of these resolve by the time the child is two or certainly by five years of age. Asthma seems to be a lot more persistent and you have the allergic rhinitis and now a lot of food allergies and also the eosinophilic or the GI related food allergies. What we need to kind of look at is how can we prevent progression of these disorders and where do we intervene? What are the risk factors? We very well know the effects of tobacco smoke pollutants and indoor allergens. But let's focus on the mechanism how lifestyle changes such as obesity, diet, and decreased activity impact the development of these diseases. And on the lower pink boxes, you can see other very critical intervention um, areas as well as things which facilitate or uh, inhibit the development of these diseases. A lot of focus now you've heard on the exposure to sunlight, vitamin D deficiencies causing increased allergic diseases and the role of antioxidants and flavonoids. I was trained by Dr. Elliot Middleton, the most wonderful allergist many, many years back, who really observed the role of this and probably is the father of all of these, uh, you know, the role of flavonoids and quercetin and so on in development of these diseases. This is a very interesting slide, and I just love this, very educational. It was noted that the uh, incidence of deaths due to infectious disease dramatically decreased once there was this discovery of penicillin and vaccinations. But unfortunately, you can see that asthma started showing itself and increased, suddenly shot up, increased twofolds. Now, if we look, these allergic diseases, many varieties have increased enormously, almost tenfold. And uh, why is this so? Why is this shift happening? What is happening to the immune system? It's well observed that allergy and asthma is less common in rural areas all over the world, many studies. And here you see the city of Mumbai, the modern metro, compared to a village in India. The woman is living in close proximity to her livestock. And if you look at her hut, 
it is plastered with cow dung. No kidding, you know, no BS, but it's cow dung. So what's so special? This is very rich in endotoxin. What is endotoxin? Endotoxin is the outer um, wall, cell wall of bacteria. And it's found to stimulate the immune system and interacts with a variety of very primitive and defense receptors called the toll-like and many, many other receptors. And it actually skews the immune system towards protection. And it protects you from bacterial infections, etc. And it helps your immunity to do the right thing. And this is what we talk about uh, rather than go the wrong way, which is blocked off, which is cancer, allergies, and other diseases. And optimal stimulation helps to protect you. This is what we talk about epigenetic modification, genetics and epigenetics. So even if you have a tendency to develop these disease, you can modify it. And that's really very encouraging. Indoor allergens with uh, modern living, you can see that there's a really increased uh, concentration and severity of these exposures. And uh, I'm sure you love my little friend, the cockroach, as well as the mighty dust mite. And uh, many of us these days are uh, not grandparents, but we have grand cats or grand dogs. So what about the outdoor pollutants or outdoor pollens? Now, in urban dwellings or the urban atmosphere, because of climate change and dryness and so on, and increased environmental temperatures, the allergens are released much more. So the pollens are much meaner. And not only that, to add insult to injury, these pollens form chemicals, uh, form compounds with uh, chemicals such as automobile um, emissions, the uh, diesel particles, the respirable latex particles from tires on a hot, humid day. And uh, allergens are uh, much more profound, actually, given the relative lack of the, um, what shall I say, the vegetation. Despite that, these allergens are much more severe when compared to the rural areas. The bane of our existence, childhood obesity. You have little Tommy there being rewarded for being quiet while mama does her work. Tossed out of the window literally is a childhood that we experience with sunshine, running around in these beautiful green fields, um, exercise, a good healthy diet, maybe picking a couple of strawberries or hilgo hours up when we sneaked out to Big Hill and uh, being fed what I know was uh, the school food, a lot of spuds and uh, bread baked in our own school bakery with yeast and no chemicals. Food, Dr. Adrian uh, mentioned a lot about processed foods, which are uh, something that we need to address. And poor parenting under stressful conditions really contributes a lot more. And here you have my little champion, Mama is so proud of him, his little chubby cheeks, and says, doctor, he doesn't have an appetite, doesn't eat a thing, you wonder why. So these factors actually cause inflammation in the system, and as you remember the slide that I showed before, actually modifies the genes towards inflammation, towards ill health, towards allergies and other conditions, disease conditions. Looking at food allergies, these are some of the common food allergens in childhood. Uh, and you hear a lot about peanut allergies, uh, which is kind of the model that I will use to describe what is happening in terms of a study of the effect of all of this on the immune system. And I'd like to present a little case. This is my first case as an allergy immunology fellow. So a nine month old Vietnamese child was found to have sudden onset of respiratory failure. The child developed wheezing, um, difficulty breathing and turned blue within a few seconds. He was brought into the emergency room and because the doctors found that the two year old sibling was playing near him, they figured this child may have put a foreign body into this little child. And uh, to their surprise, they found that the entire throat, entire larynx was collapsed shut. So here I walk in the allergy immunology fellow, just into my fellowship day one. So I said, anaphylaxis, give some epinephrine. 
and boom, you have this representation of a child with a severe allergic reaction with swollen eyes, shut lips swollen, the rash which is spread, obviously having some difficulty breathing here. And within a few seconds, you see this uh, reaction resolved. Well, I thought I knew it all. But life has taught me that it's much more complex. So you have a variety of reactions from very severe to in childhood, you see a lot commonly, you see childhood eczema or atopic dermatitis. Um, in about a third of these patients, it's due to food allergies, most commonly milk and egg, and sometimes peanuts and um, combination of all of this. A lot of these children are prone to uh, at risk for developing asthma. And uh, the good news, as I said, most of this eczema does resolve once you address the food allergy issues. Not all allergens are so uh, obvious. Sometimes they're hidden. Sometimes the sensitizers um, sneaked into food that we don't know. A lot of times when things are added to make something more nutritious, for example, if you take a simple chapati atta, the wheat flour, I don't know what parents add because they think it's good for you. They add nuts, the, they add almond flour, they add soy, they add you know chickpeas flour and so on. Now, baked goods has a lot of sensitizers, uh, especially if you're allergic to eggs and nuts and, and you have a lot of you know sesame and so on, which are sensitizing, uh, sensitizing foods, I would say. Never trust anything that's eggless, especially if you're egg allergic. There have been many incidents of even fatalities when somebody thought there was no egg, ate it, and some children have actually died because it's not labeled and uh, people don't tell you what there is. Beware of gravies. Uh, most mothers and grandmothers sneak in all sorts of things like almond and cashew nut and so on. And flavoring agents are also in an allergy prone individual. You have to find out what there is. For example, anchovies in Caesar salad or uh, fish oil in uh, shrimp paste and so on. Peanuts added or peanut flour added for flavoring. In Maharashtra, they use senga for a lot of things and so on. It's interesting to find out what the regional cuisines are and what is used as traditional foods and what is added. I'm not going to get into dyes and preservatives. It's a whole other topic. And anything that's natural may actually be quite unnatural, at least as a food, just to throw some trivia in. And this was the case of a mother who had a child who'd go into repeated anaphylaxis and, it found, and we found that every time she kind of went out it seemed to happen. So we looked into what could she have eaten, really didn't find anything consistent. So what's common between these cherries, uh, the toppings and the dessert and this lipstick? The answer, my friend, are not blowing in the wind, but it's growing on this cactus. This is actually the cochineal beetle, which secretes a red dye, which is used as food coloring several times. Not very appetizing. Hmm? So how can we prevent the development of these diseases? Do we feed our children dirt? Do we feed them and uh, improve their gut health, which is very, very important? I was reading articles and a lot of research is done, you won't believe it, on fecal transplant. I wouldn't stoop so low. I'd rather change my diet and rather change you know, the diet of infants instead of giving processed baby food. Maybe we can switch over, as uh, Adrian was saying, to fresh food. How about probiotics? There's a whole science. How about anti-inflammatories, flavonoids, and so on? And, uh, you know, my grandmother used to give me yogurt every day. I think we have a lot of food habits which are pretty healthy and time-tested. If we were to intervene, we have to intervene very early in the antenatal period itself. Breastfeeding is uh, recommended very highly, and we have to look at infant feeding practices. So I'm going to sort of leave you with this slide. And how do we develop tolerance? How can we tolerate these and not develop allergies or other disease for that matter? If you look, the gut is one organ which is processes the maximum number of allergens every single day, every single day. And an infant learns to swallow even before the child is born. The child learns to swallow before the child learns to breathe. So your intervention has to be done very early and the gut seems to be the key to sort of see how we can intervene very early and modify this process. 
Now, there are a lot of protective things such as the acid pH, the enzymes, the secretory IgA, the, that's, that's the immunoglobulins. And actually, if you look, these cells are very tight and they're called tight junction. They do not allow any allergen to penetrate an intact gut. The allergen instead is sent to where it's supposed to be, received by the M cell, and then processed here, the, the T regulatory cells. These cells actually regulate, welcome these uh, allergens and then sends them to the pious patches, which you remember from your biology days. That's very rich in lymphoid tissue and a lot of education happens. So these educated cells then go to the lymph nodes and they go to the system and they behave. On the other hand, if you have cells which <clears throat> gain direct access through a leaky gut, then they become immunogenic. So what are the factors which help protect? One of the very important thing is the microbiome. That is your gut bacteria. Friendly bacteria um, help. These are um, you know, the biodiverse rich bacteria. So it's important to improve gut health. Prevent inflammation. The structure and nature of the allergens are also very important. Processing actually alters the allergen and makes it immunogenic. And uh, let me just end this. We can talk more about it if you're interested. But I was just looking, so what kind of a message do I leave you with? And what you see, these big fields are land races, germplasm cultivars, the last of the biodiverse original right strain. So we're losing our biodiversity. And uh, medicine is not just about the doctor, the prescription, and the patient. It's much bigger. It's much bigger. It involves governance. It involves, you know, all of us are actively participating. It involves preserving of the environment and so on. And what better place but Lovedale? The pristine environment, the exercise, running up and down, the happy, carefree lives. I think it's something we need to get back to. And uh, we've had a wonderful opportunity to have experienced that childhood and have pretty healthy immune systems. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, uh, Shraddha, uh, I'm sorry, we have just five minutes before uh, Shraddha comes in, but I'd like to quickly run to Doc Sujata and ask her a few questions. Uh, Doc, you, Doc Sujata, you, 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 you spoke about obesity, childhood obesity, and uh, allergy. Now, obesity per se is not an allergen. So what is the relationship between childhood obesity or obesity per se and allergy? Uh, 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 what is the connection? Okay, thank you. Um, actually, as I mentioned, obesity uh, induces these pro-inflammatory or these chemicals which skew the body, the immune system towards developing allergy. Now, when you talk about obesity, I think it's tied into lack of activity as well as... Um, um, poor diet, poor conditioning. So perception of breathing is definitely more intense, the difficulty breathing. Also, once these children have lost weight, then asthma resolves quite a bit. So there's a lot of complex factors involved in this. So Dr. Sujada, I have a question, uh, which is of course related to my field. Uh, since you're talking about asthma and allergies, uh, we've seen the rates of stress go up very high right now. How would uh, stress, uh, would it elevate the levels of allergies and asthma? Yes, that's a very interesting question and thank you. Definitely stress has a great bearing on disease expression, also disease creation, as you're very well aware of. Now, if it's just an acute stress, the body can deal with it. But it's this chronic stress, which again favors inflammation. Secondly, a significant amount of depression associated with asthma, more so than any other disease, not even cancer. So that's an area which needs to be addressed. And thirdly, I find that especially teenagers and a lot of young adults are so stressed, they've actually forgotten how to breathe. They are walking around, I don't know, with their vocal cords just clamped down. So we have to teach them to relax. So yes, stress is a very major factor not just in the development, but also in dealing with, and uh, we should address the non-medical component of it, I think, to a larger extent before just uh, giving them medicines, excessive medicines. 
Um, I, uh, uh, Dr. Sujatha, you know, uh, a frightening slide uh, that you brought up uh, uh, showed a whole lot of foods, natural foods. I'm talking about wheat and peanuts and milk uh, and things like that, natural foods, yes. but yet they come onto your allergen list. Now, under those circumstances, how do we manage this? I think uh, not everybody is allergic to it. So what we have to look at, who are the children at risk for developing allergies, and then intervene at that point and see what can be done. So it's not everybody who has it. But these are the, amongst the list of childhood allergies, these are the top allergens. I think okay. something has a lot to do with it. Timing, nature of the allergen, the structure, you know, how you feed children. There are a whole lot of factors which are involved. I'm a big fan of your subject, Dr. Uh, Sujata. I'll tell you why, because I was uh, at the table one day and my wife collapsed from a food allergy. Could you believe that? We didn't quite know why she couldn't breathe and we took her immediately to the hospital and it was one of those allergies that you speak about. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Dr. Sujata, uh, you know, I would like to hear your story, your journey. What got you so interested in this? Well, um, as you all may know, uh, my journey started in school. My father, Mr. Gundura, was my best teacher, of course, amongst all my other wonderful teachers. But I spent a lot of time with him. And I had the unique opportunity of not just being in school and getting everything out of school, but also going back home. So learning happened every moment. And it was in a very fun way observing the trees, knowing about plants. So that's helped me a lot in understanding allergens. And then I went on to uh, train in railway hospital, great peers uh, there, and then to the University of Buffalo Children's Hospital. Amazing journey. I trained with the best. I trained with people who wrote textbooks. But one thing they always, their message was, what did you do for the patient? So what's driven me and what keeps me going is what I have learned from patients and also their parents and their families who've trusted me to take care. It's a big responsibility. But I want to tell you one little story, okay? So I know we never give in. I think we should follow our passions and we just keep doing something. But one story I'd like to tell you, I was kind of out of touch with Lovedale for a bit in my own world. And when I gave uh, to Bangladesh, I had been invited to give a lecture, food allergies again. and. As I was speaking, what happened was right from next to me, my entire pouch with my passport, OCI card, the works, including the money, the visa arrival, everything was disappeared, stolen. And here I was stuck. The only connection I had was that last minute Wi-Fi sent a WhatsApp group. And within seconds, my classmate Joe Katukar called me. And this is what he said. I didn't want to ask anybody because nobody, can, you know, I was uh, stranded over there. He said, Sujata, can I help you? Do you need money? And he took care of me. So that's my little comeback to love tale. So when there is no hope, never give in, there's a Laurentian who will always bail you out and will always guide you. Like Professor Kennedy is telling us a lot of good stuff and things that we need to do and helped us focus on our health. So never give in. Thank you, Shraddha. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sujata. And now Shraddha, we come to you, if, if, uh, if you don't mind. You know, physical well-being seems to be an easy thing to do. You do a little bit of exercise and heavens, you're okay. Mental well-being, now that's a different story. Behavior therapy, changing the way we behave. Oh heavens, those are complicated things. Could you enlighten us a little bit on this? Sure, Professor Adrian, I'm uh, a person who hears stories. I believe that hearing, sharing is healing. Uh, so I'm gonna start off with my story. So I walked into Lovedale from a very affluent, conservative, Sindhi joint family uh, where the role of the woman was extremely restricted. So my move to Lovedale was rebellious. I was an adolescent. I was a girl who walked in on 11th standard. And uh, Lovedale inculcated certain principles of self-discipline, independence, 
uh, but most importantly it gave me the power to think the freedom to think about my dream uh, post lovedale it was very obvious that my family would want me to get married uh, but breaking the society norms the conditional norms i took off to australia for an undergraduate degree uh, you know having seen mental health issues in the family uh, seeing the stigma that was associated with it back then and even now i was very curious to know as to why people behave the way they did uh, and why were some of them targeted so on my journey back to india to do my masters in clinical psychology uh, i took up a project uh, in an aids organization it was an international project and through all these years i've seen that the pain the hurt the anger the trauma which patients uh, come with uh, you know i worked with a psychiatrist uh, dr anjali chhabria who's one of the most uh, inspiring women indian psychiatrist uh, and i realized that there's a lot of work to be done and i kept believing in myself uh, mental health is still something that we don't talk about people still shy to come into the clinic of course the pandemic has changed a lot uh, people are now coming and saying that it is okay not to be okay uh, we see a lot more people coming in right now we all know that the levels of anxiety depression are on the rise all over the world and we are currently as who has pointed out uh, you know we are looking at a mental health pandemic post the covid pandemic so i think it is very important to destigmatize the entire field and to realize uh, you know most of us tend to react in certain ways uh, you know coping strategies have changed so you know right now if you see a lot of young adults uh, the coping mechanisms are basically based on addiction so you're either using alcohol you're using tobacco uh, there's a lot of drug abuse uh, and this is a form of numbing your thoughts you know of numbing the pain uh, most people tend to become very aggressive uh, you know they are dominating they're bullying and some of us shut down into a depression you know they become passive and i think what therapy is sort of teaching everybody is you know have that assertive communication build your communication strategies engage in the conflict resolution you know bridge the gap between your relationships uh, i think what uh, in the in the last uh, couple of months we've seen uh, with the us election uh, there's a lot of being a uh, lot of narcissism being spoken about leaders establishing that they know it all uh, and i think what we are looking today is a transition to a more empathetic compassionate and acceptance of society so we are looking at unconditional acceptance of the self and of the others we must see that over uh, over time we have become very conditional we become very judgmental uh, we are criticizing a lot more we are judging ourselves as well and constantly people regardless of their age regardless of their gender or uh, the social status or their positions you know walk in and say you know i don't feel good enough uh, and so i think we are constantly living in this whole fear of uh, how to be be good enough and i think that acceptance the self acceptance is not there so a lot of well being happiness is related to this unconditional self acceptance you know moving away from the perfectionist attitude and allowing yourself to make mistakes you know allowing ourselves to fail so most people coming from the army and navy background uh, you know we know there's a lot of fear we know there's fear when we walk into the battlefield uh, there is a lot of fear of losing your life there's a lot of fear about how the family will cope once you're gone so some amount of concern sadness is a normal emotion and today mental health looks at you know unhealthy emotions and healthy emotions so we are trying to move in an era where we're looking at healing people getting them more healthy and we are destigmatizing it from depression anxiety or personality disorder and so i i think i want to end with a quote from the very famous psychologist called albert ellis uh the institution that i have trained in and he often said that people need to have the courage to change what they can to accept what you can't and to find wisdom between the two you know find the difference between the two 
so i think once you get that i think you let go you let go of the control you let go of your anger and i think you heal shraddha you uh, you have quoted one of my favorite quotations and that is to change the things i can and to uh, accept those things that i can't i'm also ever so touched by uh, doc sajatha as well as your never given stories uh, thank you very very personal and i must tell you that florence nightingale is well is doing well today we have two fabulous florence nightingales on our panel yeah as compared to a single me thank you very much however you know you you've spoken so much about uh, the various stresses that we as adults have my own research tells me that our children probably have as much if not more stress than our, than us and especially with uh, trying to keep up with the peers trying to uh, excel in their studies and things like that how do we teach our children or oh, how, how do we manage stress in in children how, how, how do we do that that's uh, that's very important today because of the lockdown we have seen that we all are restricted to our environments there's a lot of change of lifestyle i think professor edwin here i want to just point out is that often enough children don't have a feeling vocabulary you know so we don't teach our children i don't remember learning this in school uh that you know what it's okay to fail it's okay to be fearful so i think what's very very important from the very beginning i'm a, i'm a mother of two children and and that's what i tell my children you know use the vocabulary use words the feeling words the hurt the shame the embarrassment uh and i think what parents need to today realize it is an era of collaboration rather than control so i think we need to collaborate more we need to give them more freedom i mean of course the internet has given us enormous uh, freedom uh, so you know parents, uh, children have that exposure uh, back in the days we didn't have it we didn't have it in lawrence as well uh, so i think we need to be giving them freedom and at the same time giving them the value so that they can be responsible enough so it's freedom versus responsibility so we have most kids going abroad and you know some of them going into drugs or alcohol but i think when there is a strong value system uh, it will work well shada uh, i want to go back to something that everybody is facing right now yep that is the loneliness especially not just the adults and the many people who are dying alone but also i think children with lack of interaction uh, between their peers not playing how can we cope with and how do we do deal with that dr sujata that's that's definitely true i think uh, not only with death but we have seen a lot of loneliness with the covid isolation you know with the quarantine uh, like you rightly said it is not only our seniors but the generation z as we call it uh, you know they are extremely lonely right now constantly on their gadgets Uh, i think what we need to do you know one very important tip that i can give is uh, develop a ritual you know a ritual to connect to people so you know you can leave out some time from your online schooling or people who are living alone working from home can develop a ritual to connect to their friends on the weekend uh, you know now nowadays it's happening on the zoom calls so develop a ritual of connectivity the second thing that i would like to say is you can create in uh, you know in loneliness so in confinement you tend to get very creative you catch up on things you learn a new skill you read a lot and i think that would work as well so creativity in your confinement is very important here yeah. i still need to get back to that one question and that is how do we manage mental well being can you give us a few suggestions so professor adrian there is a, a very very again a very very famous psych psychotherapist called dr martin seligman he was uh, heading the american psychological association and he gave us 
something called he was he's the founder of positive psychology and gave us something called the parma which is p e r m a which is very closely associated to karma and uh, parma basically highlights uh, the 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 role of positive emotions engagement maintaining relationships developing your competence you know so constantly building up creating growth uh, of course all this requires a lot of effort a depressed person finds it very difficult to engage to create or to connect uh, so you have to you know so somebody who is going through depression or anxiety would require therapy and but for a normal person just moving on with your accomplishments also connecting to people relationships is extremely important here shada um a lot is said about how to cope with children and you've given some strategies for the school children i think most of us uh, probably did not do very well in the psychosocial domain it's because of living and the way we live so what tips could you suggest what are the key tips just some take home tips for us on how to have or create or you know set up this for mental well being so like i said you know uh, i think we need to move away from the perfectionist society that we are in uh, we need to realize that it is okay to make mistakes we are human beings we are fallible we make mistakes uh, also dr sujata i want like to uh, highlight your dr professor kennedy had spoken about the type a personality you know who are very harsh on themselves mm-hmm. uh, and they tend to have this self downing attitude you know we are very demanding on ourselves as well at times so in this rat race of achieving and accomplishment i think we need to realize that at the end of the day we can give ourselves a break be a little more compassionate to yourself you know be you know allow yourself to engage build those relationships and take a breather you know you spoke about taking the oxygen so i think take a breather at the end of the day how can we be more compassionate i think we've become very selfish as a society yes so uh we for ourselves but also to others you know how can we make this a habit right. of- so dr sujata in the last uh, couple of months what psychology has today started focusing on something called compassion fatigue uh compassion fatigue was earlier discussed when people went through crisis in cases of emergency and you know this was mostly associated with doctors and nurses however today we are seeing compassion fatigue in every house and compassion fatigue is basically losing your empathy losing your tolerance so we become very very intolerant as a society the frustration levels are very high uh, people are awfulizing a lot more they feel everything is going to come to an end so i think objectively we need to see what is the worst case scenario we are going to survive through this um, and what worked in the past you know when you talk about even grief you know Uh, i lost my dad a couple of years back through cancer and uh, you know you can heal by giving that some kind of meaning now my meaning uh, to that was of course doing the tobacco cessation course and that gave me a lot of you know purpose that gave my father's death some purpose and meaning so i think we can get compassionate by just allowing ourselves to be mindful you know a lot has been spoken about mindfulness here through the last couple of months mindfulness is just being aware you know uh, walking in into nature is extremely helpful uh, being aware of your breath uh, i think yoga has taken a huge leap with mindfulness there are a lot of studies which have been done which is saying yoga is very very helpful uh, and i think uh, you know just simply accept what is inevitable Uh, uh, we have five minutes before uh, Kalpana comes on to uh, uh, to ask us her questions. So I'm just wondering if between us we can exchange a few questions about yes. the totality Professor of uh, Kennedy, what I, we've spoken I, about. Professor Kennedy, I have a question for you. You know, you spoke about lifestyle medicine. Could you define that for us? Okay, lifestyle medicine. lifestyle medicine deals with your day-to-day activities your sleep your exercise the food you eat the habits you have could be smoking or whatever your day-to-day activities and the effect it has on your health now we know 
that if you were to look at the cardiac ailment, well then beyond the hypertension, diabetes, and hypercholesteremia, you have obesity, you have a sedentary life, you have smoking, you have stress. So lifestyle is your day-to-day -day activities that result in the diseases you have and the utilization of lifestyle change, managing your weight, managing your stress, doing your exercise, quitting smoking in order to alleviate the lifestyle ailment. I imagine that would be a good definition. Well, Adrian, you've, yes. you've proved that you're younger than all of us with your enthusiasm and I know your exercise every day. So tell us, I know you were a star athlete. So can you share some of your inspiring moments in school, at work and life? Tell us your level. Oh, now that was a question I was hoping would never be asked, but I'm glad you did. I have to, what shall I say, confront my reality. And I'm grateful to that extent to Shraddha when she said that we have to forgive ourselves if we fail. I agree with you on that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I'm one of those failures in a matter of speaking and, and thank you for allowing me to forgive myself. But as a consequence of early failure, uh, I, I was not considered, uh, it was thought that I would not be successful in my senior Cambridge exams and I was not allowed to sit for the Cambridge exam in the school with which I was. And uh, I then moved on to do the Cambridge exam in another school. I got a first class. I then went on to do eight degrees in, you know, in my postgrad study and ended up with a PhD. So that is one aspect of my never given story. You know, the three words that I picked up from Lovedale, the three words that I picked up from Lovedale uh, that has been the story of my life is never given by and large. But I have a little more to say. You know, when I was a young sports person, I thought to myself, well, I've done badly in life up to now, you know, not so good in school and things. I, I've got to do something to delight my parents. And I decided, well, if I'm a talented sports person, let's do that. And not only was I a school champion and a college champion and a university champion, I went on with perseverance. Remember the never given words. I went on with perseverance to become a national champion and a nation champion, and then later helped to organize uh, events like the Commonwealth Games and so on. And my never given story doesn't end there. Uh, well, it can carry on forever, but that's what it is. You know, when I was a young executive, I decided I had to be the CEO. And as luck would have it, I've been the CEO a couple of times. So Never Given was a story that has been imbibed in my soul. And thank you so much for it. Professor Kennedy, in my language, that would be called resilient. You would be high on a resilient scale. You know, resilient is rising away above the adversities of your life. So, uh, yeah, I, I just want to come back to my question on lifestyle medicine. You know, uh, you gave us the definition. What would be some of the components what, that you would define in terms of lifestyle medication? Well, uh, the components of lifestyle, the very first thing would be evaluation. So we have already done the, in a manner of speaking, we've already done one evaluation. I evaluated the different aspects of each of our lifestyles. That is number one. You evaluate an individual's lifestyle to find out which areas is he at risk. Is he sleeping enough? Is he doing enough exercise? Is he eating the right food? Uh, is he behaving well and not smoking and not drinking too much and stuff like that? You do the evaluation and then you correlate that with his ailment situation. Now, does he have hypertension? Does he have diabetes? Does he have hypercholesteremia? Does he have cancer? If, does he have an allergy, for example? And if he has any of these things, what is the lifestyle connection? Uh, is it because of too much of stress? Uh, is it because he's overweight? Uh, is it because he's sedentary? You make the connection and then, so the first step is that you do the evaluation. The second step is you identify the problem and then you give him lifestyle solutions. Like I said, you could learn, uh, teach individuals to manage weight, teach individuals to exercise, teach individuals and send them off to Shraddha to teach them how to manage their stress. If they have allergies, you need to look at medical advice to manage the allergies. Use lifestyle change as a means of improving health. 
So lifestyle, as I suggested earlier, identification of problems, step one, managing weight, doing your exercise, managing stress, sleeping enough, and uh, behaving well in terms of not smoking and stuff. Those are the components of lifestyle medicine. Thank you. What? I have one question for you. Yes. Now, I know you said your tests are all validated and you know, it's been used widely. So can you replace doctors and just do the screening? People do the annual check on for themselves. Can you replace doctors? I know you've uh, administered. No, but the question is, can you replace God? No, doctors are God. That is a reality we have to accept. Even I would turn to a doctor in medical need. I would, I would, I would. You cannot replace doctors. You can support doctors and doctors can support us. The question that I could comfortably ask is, can you doctors replace the health professional? The answer to that question very likely is no. It is multidisciplinary teams. Whether it is in the space of medicine or whether it is in the space of health, we need multidisciplinary teams. For example, in my area of work, in lifestyle medicine, my lead professional is a physician. He is supported by a nurse. I have with my team a psychologist, a nutritionist, an exercise therapist. And in these modern days, I have my computer programmer. The only person they don't need is me. But doctors, no, irreplaceable. I think you should take Shraddha on your team also. Just oh, like Shraddha is too expensive for me. But I'd okay. love to have her. But I will get in touch with Shraddha anyway. And Doc, I'm going to get in touch with you too. I've already mentioned it to you. Maybe you okay. can see. fly me into Dubai and then we can talk. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, 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 uh, I'd like to thank you all very much. I'd like to thank you all very much for, uh, for helping me in this session. Remember that uh, I'm an advocate. I'm an advocate for uh, healthy lifestyles and I'm, ad I'm an advocate for lifestyle medicine. I've spent 40 years of my life trying to propagate this field and I am so grateful for the help that I've got from our medical professionals, from our psychologists, from our nutritionists. And I am deeply grateful to OL Nation also for agreeing to, to do something in the area of health. And now we have Kalpana. Uh, thank you so much, Kalpana. I'm sorry for having taken your time. No, 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 that's perfectly all right. I want to just uh, thank all three of you for that wonderful conversation, yeah. sharing ex experience, expertise, knowledge with uh, this old uh, old Laurentian community. There is a question I have for you from um, Sharon Koshi. She asks, what advice do you have for parents of toddlers that would help introduce their children to healthy ways of living from a young age? Toddlers would mean Doc Sujata. Well, and Shraddha too, possibly. Shraddha too. Shraddha and me, I think, okay. Uh, I think to get the Simple stuff out of the way. Uh, probably um, the right diet, the right timing, you know, the right kind of uh, inputs you give to your child. But I think also, uh, especially infant feeding and diet is very important. So it's been found that if you just let children choose their food and not force things on them, over time, they naturally to pick the healthy foods. So I think that's something we need to uh, learn, to kind of unlearn what we are forcing our children to do. I think some of the traditional diets really have stood its time. And there's a lot of science behind that, that uh, we need to re-explore that and look into what best we can give the children. But I think above all, in this day and age, parenting. So I'm gonna ask Shraddha to address that issue. The key is actually healthy parenting. Before Shraddha comes in, Shraddha, before you come in, love, just one, just one little uh, statement from my side. You know, I, I absolutely agree with everything that uh, Dr. Shraddha says. I have to just add one, just one sentence. It is so important for toddlers, children. I'm talking about babies below the age of six, little babies before they go to school, because I believe the word toddler was used. It is yes. so important for us to let them play, to allow them to play. Now, at this point of time in my life, I rush back from work at five o'clock. I make sure that no matter what meeting I have, 
the chairman can wait. I rush back, I run off to my grandchildren, and I make sure that I play with them. I make sure that I play with them for at least one or two hours. I think physical activity in children is so important. Playing with children teaches them how to lose, how to win. It teaches them how to mingle, how to be social, and so on and so forth. And I'm sure there are many more things that Shraddha would like to add. So Kalpana, I want to just add here that make the entire activity a little bit more fun. Of course, I'm sure like uh, Dr. Sujada was saying, give the choices to the child. But I think we also need to encourage, you know, the effort that they're making. So it's not only the achievement, but the basic effort they're making to eat a broccoli or a carrot, you know, mm -hmm. and make it a little more fun. Uh, yes. Probably a parent can also share their own experiences. Uh, you know, we don't want our children to make the same mistakes as we've done. So probably share your own experiences from the past. That might work. Thank you. So add a little bit over there. Try and make your own food. Have fun in the kitchen with the children. Yep. That way you can ensure that you're giving them the good stuff. You're giving them natural stuff. You're introducing to a wide variety of colors and textures. Um, if they adapt to it naturally. So it's not excess of anything. I think moderation is a key. Use moderation nothing excessive just because something that's good doesn't mean you have to force feed or you know use only one thing a variety yeah. and a moderation i think all of you have given excellent uh, advice to sharon between good parenting to physical you know contact play food eat so i think there's plenty in there and um, i think all of us will remember when we were <laughs> kids we, our parents would you know hand feed us and in my personal opinion that gives you good taste also growing up <laughs> But I personally have a couple of uh, questions for each of you. Um, just to wrap things up, you can keep your answers brief, just one word or a few sentences if you like. Um, to uh, Professor Kennedy, uh, considering we might have compromised our well-being in growing up, how do we, f how do we find a way to grow younger as we age? You know, it is never too late, never too late. If you were smoking, and I'm not saying you are, it's just an analogy. If you are smoking and you give up smoking, well then within two years, uh, you would be almost back to normal. You will find that your lung regeneration, you will find that your uh, fitness levels improve, you'll find that your circulation improves. So if you use that analogy with, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, a lost youth in a manner of speaking, and you want to get younger as you age now, it's all very simple. Rule number one, I'll just give you five rules. Rule number one, please have a medical screening. Understand exactly what your problem is. Rule number two, eat the right food in the right quantities. Don't forget your fruit and vegetables. Rule number three, do not forget to exercise every day. It is so important. Half an hour every day is great. Rule number four, manage your stresses and tensions with loving companionship and friendship, solve your problems. Rule number five, sleep, 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 sleep. Don't forget, sleep for six to eight hours a day. Rule number six, uh, you've got to give up that smoking. You've got to manage that alcohol. And rule number seven, safety at all times, every time. If you do that, Kalpana, you're going to look, well, you're already, you're already five years Okay, just follow the simple rules that your grandma told you, the simple rules that your grandma told you, and you will grow younger as you age. Adrian, Adrian I don't want to go back to learning my ABCs again. <laughs> a long time true, to come true. Here. Okay, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Rohan, do you have a question for any of uh, Shajata or Shraddha or? Yes, um, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, it's been really uh, interesting. And um, we've got, I, I have a couple of uh, questions and some housekeeping notes as well as we go along. Uh, one of my questions, I, I listened to Sujata, and this did not come up in our prep sessions. I did not know that genes could be modified as a result of your diet. I mean, I think you made a comment about that. I was taught that we were given our genes and that was our fate. Now, are you saying fate can be altered? from a genetic point of view? Absolutely. Uh, several, you know, it's, it's really interesting that uh, if you give the right input, the proteins actually translate and it tells you to make the good, the favored proteins. Definitely your environment, 
your uh, what you eat, it, you can alter to a very large extent in a lot of patients. So that's what we try and see. That's why, you know, eating healthy, exercising, all of that is very important. Again, if you talk allergies, if you talk disease prevention, it's the right timing of food, it's the right kind of food, the right proportion that you introduce along with the other environmental factors. But the answer is definitely yes. Good yeah, genes, like yeah, good genes in good conditions do well. Bad genes in good conditions do well. Bad genes in bad conditions, that's disaster. So you have a choice. Thank, I absolutely thank, agree thank with, uh, I, I agree with Sujata. Uh, your genes are permanent, but activating or not activating your genes depend, depends upon you and your environment. You can have a bad gene. If you never activate it, nothing's gonna happen to you. You can have a good gene, but if you're overweight and highly stressed and smoke, etc., it becomes a bad gene. You can change your genes. Dr. Sujata is absolutely right. The science of epigenetics. It's no more the science of genetics. It is now the science of epigenetics. You switch your genes on and off depending upon how you behave. My question for, thank you so much, Adrian and uh, Dr. Sujata. My question for Shraddha is linked to obviously her specialty, which is mental health. And we're talking about boarding school kids. Um, you know, the, uh, ha has the situation changed today? Uh, you know, when we were in school, that's about, you know, 30 plus years ago, the situation was very different. I met the headmaster. I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Prabhakar last week when I passed through Lovedale. And he told me, uh, you old Laurentians of my generation and uh, those before me, probably Adrian, talk too much about your good times and bad times in school. Today, those most of those bad times, quote unquote, with, and I'm talking about bullying, don't exist. I mean, obviously they would manifest in different ways. Uh, what is your take uh, on the situation of, uh, let's say, Lovedale, which is a co-educational boarding school? Uh, is the situation the same? Is it gonna get better or is it gonna get worse? Uh, I, I, I think definitely not. So we hear a lot more about certain cases of bullying or abuse. We've heard in some, a couple of very renowned uh, boarding schools in the last couple of years. They've come in the papers. Uh, but I must say this is also because of the exposure that is increased. So a lot more people talk about mental health today. Back then, we didn't have a therapist. Today, there's a mandatory rule for every school to have a therapist. So I definitely think that we are talking a lot more. The situation is much better for children. Children have the adequate help. They can, you know, if you go and say that I'm anxious or I'm low, they can go and speak to somebody, uh, you know, who has a cabin in the same room, in the same school. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Sujata. And I just want to emphasize to all of us who are, all of uh, my friends and peers, uh, and Lore, fellow Laurentians who are listening, that the headmaster made it very, very, very clear. He has zero, zero tolerance for uh, this type of activity. And the school has actually blossomed and children are thriving. And I think they're just waiting for them to get back to Lovedale. And like Johnny uh, mentioned, that uh, the, 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 the interest in getting back to Lovedale is um, as a boarding but school. I just want to point increasing. out here, sorry, I just want to point yes, out go here, ahead. Is, is, you know, well, while there was bullying in school at that time, there was a lot of compassion as well. So Absolutely. I think we need to take both the perspectives in, into account. Well, I, I enjoyed my time. I enjoyed my time. I mean, I, although I joined Labelle when I was, uh, I think, eight or just, just before eight. So it was pretty young. Uh, and I think uh, folks like Adrian probably joined a bit earlier. And we and there's nothing to say that we did not enjoy our time. It's just an aspect of school which we, you know, we talk about now and then. And he said, if you guys can speak less and less about those things to your spouses, probably your kids will get back into Labelle too. So that's something he, that's a very nice comment he made. And thank you so much, Mr. Prabhakar, for welcoming me and my family and friends uh, when, we visit, when we visit you in Love Day. So I'd like to thank you, uh, Adrian. Uh, you know, we spoke about the session many months ago, and I, I think it's, uh, it was well-formed. We've had really good specialists, Shraddha and Sujata, Dr. Sujata as well. Thank you once again, Adrian. And obviously, as part of our working group, uh, your job is not yet done. We've got a lot more to do next month. And the months are uh, coming. So thank you so much uh, for all your input, Adrian.
Oh, you namaste, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, uh, something I'd like to tell everybody right now is uh, some housekeeping notes. We obviously have uh, a session for uh, um, OL Nation next month. Next month, we're going to focus on the creative arts, performing arts, actually. We've got some fantastic old Laurentians who are going to participate. Mira Balachandran from the batch of 1980, if I'm not mistaken, and Rosa George, who probably is from 99, I'm not too sure, uh, sorry, 89, I think. Anyway, they will talk about the art form, dance as an art form, colory, and various other things. We have a few more specialists who are gonna come on, and we look forward to seeing you guys next month. Uh, the date may be modified because we are, in, we are in Christmas season. We will update you on that as we go along. Separately, uh, just to be clear, the OLA, the OLA has been very active. Six months have gone, seven months have gone actually. This year is coming to a close and we are so happy uh, that as all Laurentians, you guys have participated and supported these sessions, the OL Assembly and the OL Nation, of course. So don't forget, uh, these days I need to tell you to subscribe, like our page, pages and support the system. Thank you once again, everybody. It's been a great uh, pleasure uh, hosting this session, and I look forward to seeing you seeing seeing you again.